Amen. Amen. We do have a friend in Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Are you blessed? Yes. It's a happy Sabbath, and I am very happy to be here at the Mission Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, I want to thank Pastor Brown for the kind invitation and and allowing me to come and just speak to to you. And uh, I haven't come to the valley very often, and so when I think of the valley, or initially when I thought of the valley, I, I thought of uh, a very tall mountains. You know, a, a nice, beautiful valley, and uh, from San Antonio all the way down here, it's just flat uh, surface, and so no valley. Maybe one of you might know the history of why they call it the valley, but um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and um, I believe that the Lord is here with us, and He will bless our message today, and uh, our message this morning is entitled, Where Your Treasure there your heart. And that is from the scripture reading we read this morning. And uh, how about we begin with prayer once again and ask the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that we are here humbled in your presence on the Sabbath day. And now, Lord, we invite once again your Holy Spirit to be with us, Lord, as we hear the word of God. Teach us, enlighten us, Lord, and Fill us with joy and rest, restore us in your salvation. We pray, Lord, as the song said, that if we have a broken heart, that we can find a faithful friend in Jesus. That is our request. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you something that I found very important in the scriptures. Uh, but before I do, I just want to just say a few things of what's happening this month. I'm a, I have a very busy month, and uh, I believe today is the third of the month, and in about 23 days or so, a very special event is going to happen in my life. Not that it has anything to do with the sermon, but uh, this morning, the, pa uh, the Sabbath school teacher said that when Jesus his light is in us. It's very difficult to contain it. So uh, I can't contain my happiness of this special event. Anybody can guess? No? Yes, praise the Lord. You know, I tell my friends that I took God's uh, counsel seriously, that it is not good for man to be alone. <laughs> so pray for me. And I'm very happy that uh, we'll, make, we'll be making this, this decision. I tell those who I, uh, I, I share with, that uh, it is not a simple decision, but it is a covenant that her and I are making together. You know, we believe that marriage is a, a sacred uh, institution ordained by God, and so we take that very seriously. And, and I also take the opportunity to tell those who are either contemplating marriage or are, it, are already married uh, to read The Adventist Home by Ellen White. Uh, my fiancé and I are reading that book. We started reading it and uh, whenever we get a chance we read together uh, almost every day and uh, I think that has really changed our lives and I believe that it will enrich your marriage. Um, you know the very important topic that I want to share with you is concerning our treasures or our stuff. How many of you have a lot of stuff? <laughs> Not a lot of us, or at least not a lot, want to admit that we have a lot of stuff. You know, as I was, ever since I left home to go to Southwestern uh, to study, my life has been very simple, really. I can say, I can summarize my life as in one word, and that is a nomad. I've been uh, just used to traveling from one place to another, and so my stuff, I can summarize it in just two suitcases, because really I have been accustomed to just going from one place to another, and, and I know that Sooner or later, I will be leaving. Therefore, I tend not to accumulate things. And that is until I decided to get married. You know, because now um, I realize we're talking together and we realize, oh, you know, we need a, uh, a kitchen table. 
and then we need a sofa, and then we need a, a bed, and then, and here I am thinking, you know, yes, we, knew, we do need these things, but I'm thinking, we're just accumulating more and more things. And when the time is, when it's time to go, then what, you know, how are we going to carry all these things? I'm just used to living and sleeping in a ma air mattress, you know what I mean? And so just pick up, just like Abraham pitched his tent, and uh, when God said go, but now things are different. And so I think that's the culture we're moving to. As a result of having so much stuff, we need a place besides our house to store all of the stuff we have. And we call it self-storage. According to a statistic done by a market research company, the self-storage industry, the annual revenue in the United States, self-storage is now $33 billion, having grown 50% in the last six years. Now, do you know what that means? If it grew 50% in the last six years, most likely the next six to ten years, that's going to double. And so people will continue to accumulate more things that they probably already uh, that they probably need. Now, what is even more interesting is that within these statistics, we have many Christians that are part of these uh, this industry of accumulating more things. We are moving into a culture of having the newest, the latest, the greatest, and we seem to find our identity in the things that we own, and therefore we want more. Black Friday. You probably know what Black Friday is, and Black Friday alone it seems to be uh, to become a holiday of its own. And ironically, Black Friday happens to be the day after Thanksgiving, which is the day after you are thankful for what you already have. And so what explains why a culture is so obsessed with having more? And I suppose that there may be many answers, and you may have some of them, but let me just give a few. One of them is consumerism. Consumerism is an economic theory which states that a progressively greater level of consumption is beneficial to the consumer. In other words, that the more you buy, the more you accumulate, the better off you will be and the better off society is as well. I found this very interesting uh, comic strip here. This uh, husband says to the wife, look, honey, I bought something today. And she goes, oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. You know, as researchers, but researchers say the following about consumerism. As long as consumption is focused on satisfying basic human needs, safety, shelter, food, clothing, health care, education, it is not consumerism. But when on attempts to satisfy these higher needs through the simple acquisition of goods and services, consumption turns into consumerism, and consumerism becomes what? A social disease. Now someone said we buy things we don't need with the money we don't have to impress the people we don't like. Now, I want to suggest that it is more than a social disease. It is a, a deep spiritual problem. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, egocentric, self-centered, only thinking about themselves. And I want to just share this, um, this quote by Ellen White in the book Testimonies to Ministers, page 472 and 74. And she says, As the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. Go, he says, make the possessors of lands and money drunk with the cares of this life. Present the world before them in its most attractive light that they may lay up their treasure here 
and fix their affections upon earthly things. Make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truths that we hate. We need not fear their influence, for we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power and will finally be separated from God's people. Now, I found it interesting that it says um, the most the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith is not necessarily in mere uh, false teachings or doctrines, but it says to make them possessors of the things of this world. Because Satan knows when our focus is on the earthly things, when our focus is, is so focused on our possessions, our treasures here on earth, then we, by default, lose focus, lose focus on the eternal spiritual things. And let's admit it, friends, is Satan's strategy working? Are the people of God so confused, so distracted by the things of this world? Are people being distracted from the wealth and the cares of this world? You know, Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16, which I call the rich, foolish hoarder. And he says, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build greater ones. And there I will store all my grains and all my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now six times in the text, the man speaks about himself in what I call the I problem. Never does he suggest that any of his surplus ought to go to help the needy who would have constituted about 80% of the local vid villagers surrounding him. And Jesus continues saying, But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you, pre you have prepared for yourself? Now this man had his eyes laid up on the earthly treasures. His focus was on the earthly things that he had. Moreover, he said, you have laid up many things for many years. And how many of us, friends, really, even as Christians, have that mentality that we will live for many years? And therefore, we plan as if we will live here for many, many years, just like this rich order. This very night, Jesus said, your life will be demanded from you, and who will get what you have stored? Is your will God's will? How does your last will and testament read? And by the way, I want to take this opportunity. This afternoon, we will, talk, be, we will be talking about uh, our Department of Trust Services within the Texas Conference, and we will be addressing the uh, questions on wills and trusts. And um, so I invite you, I think it was at 6 o'clock, um, also, there was a survey. Uh, please, uh, if you did not fill it out, please fill it out before um, the end of this uh, service. But here's the conclusion of Jesus. In Luke 12, he says, This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Now, what was the problem with this man? You see, he was self-centered hoarding and stockpiling money and possessions rather than releasing them to serve God and meet the needs of others. Now Jesus tells of another story, and you know this story as, or, uh, as the rich young ruler. And this man approaches Jesus and he says to him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And of course Jesus begins to talk to him about keeping the commandments of God. And deep within his heart, he knew that there was something even deeper missing. And Jesus gets to the root issue of his life. 
And he says to him, Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Now you know what the Bible says, how he left, right? The Bible says that he left disheartened. Another version says that he was sorrowful. There it is. He went, uh, he was disheartened, saddened, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, friends, I want to clarify that having great possessions is not a sin. It is not wrong. Again, as Jesus said, it is where our heart is. Now, the different, um, handling our money wrong, the rich fool was not rich towards God. That's what Jesus said. That is that he did not handle money in a God-centered way. He was too self-sufficient and independent to ask God's counsel on how much money to keep and how much money to give. Both of these stories are very similar. That they are sa they're basically telling the same thing. Indeed, what the rich young ruler did is not much different than this other certain rich hoarder did. Both were so consumed by their money that they lost sight of what really matters. Both loved money and wealth more than God, and thus they proved who had their loyalty. And the common ending of both accounts seems to be that both lost out on eternal life. Unfortunately, it was just for the, uh, the earthly things that they had, they gave away in exchange for the earthly or for the eternal reward that God has for us. Now think about this. Who has bought his or her way into the kingdom of heaven? Not enough money exists to buy or build a stairway to heaven. And even, even if all the people in the world got together and, and uh, built a stairway to heaven, uh, not enough money will buy a ticket through the pearly gates. And, and friends, we are saved only by the blood of Jesus. Amen? The price of salvation has already been paid in full. That price was paid in blood. And money, of course, has its place and its purpose. The problem is that it can so easily get out of its place and get into uh, the wrong places. And that is why the Bible tells us that it is the love of money, the root of all evil. Perhaps this is why Jesus counseled us in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And friends, I have to admit, as much as we believe in this, trying to live out that belief isn't always easy. I agree because money does have a powerful lure upon people that can blind us from seeing what we need to see. And here's what money can buy. Food, clothing, housing, transportation, education, health care. It pays the bills. We definitely need money. It is useful. Now here are things people think that money can buy. People think it can buy happiness, power, influence, position, fame, popularity, security, and so on. But most definitely, here's the thing that money cannot buy. And that is happiness, joy, peace fulfillment, honor, true love, and of course, eternal life. You know, I was with my friend this week, and he was moving his stuff, and I was helping him, you know, he had to get this really big U-Haul, and I gave him a little lecture, and you know, you need a downsize, man, you just have so many things you need to be using, he's like, yeah, 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 and uh, he had a bed, and he was selling his bed, he said he paid almost six thousand dollars for a very fancy electrical bed and he was selling it and uh, he wanted me to buy it and I was almost tempted because it's one of those beds that uh, vibrate and give a massage and and if you press the buttons it, it kind of folds up and down and it's got all these buttons and it's got a USB drive and everything and and uh, and after you know once we almost departed he said you know the truth is it's just a luxury. You don't really need it. And friends, uh, money really can't buy, even the best bed in the world, let me put it that way, can't buy a good night's sleep, can it? Hmm. 
Only Jesus and his peace can really give us that comfort, even in an air mattress. Praise the Lord. And uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, this is the counsel God gives to each one of us. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. You see, friends, it is when we recognize and we acknowledge God as creator of heaven and earth, the one who owns everything, that we can finally live at peace to know that whatever the Lord has blessed us with, whatever things we do own in this life, they were, they're only perishable. We are only, the Bible says, pilgrims. We're passing by this earth. The Bible tells us that this earth will be consumed in fire along with everything that we owned. Uh, Steps to Christ, page 44, says, Whatever shall draw away the heart from God must be given up. Mammon is the idol of many. The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the golden chain that binds them to Satan. Reputation and worldly honor are worshipped by another class. The life of selfish ease and freedom from the responsibility is the idol of others. But these lavish bands must be broken. We cannot be half the Lord's and half the world's. So friends, the question goes back to what Jesus said, where is your treasure? It is a good um, thought, a good question to contemplate where our treasure, where our focus is. In his book, The Millionaire Mind, Thomas Stanley describes how many of today's millionaires got to where they are today. These millionaires are average people like you and me, and I'm just going to su summarize a few of the points of, uh, of how these millionaires we got, or got to where they are. They own their homes without a mortgage, and some of these homes are valued close to $400,000. Uh, they tend to build businesses and not wealth. And remember, these are not your Bill Gates. These are your average person. These could very well be your next-door neighbor. They tend, uh, they're not wasteful with what they have. They aren't jet-setters flying here and there, and they aren't the fashion models shown on television. They didn't make their money overnight or during market hours. They also buy quality expensive shoes, but almost have them resolved, meaning they repair them, they reuse them, they are not wasteful. Another key characteristic here is that they are committed and faithful. Uh, it says that they remain married to supportive and responsible spouses who run, who run economically productive household, clipping coupons and buying in bulk. You know, that is true. A lot of millionaires have become millionaires because of their, their lifestyle and how they save. And really, it's about principle, right? I mean, you're not, that's true. You're not going to make a million dollars by saving two or three, you know, ten cents overall. But in principle, how we live our lives is really the key point here. The bottom line is that they spend less than they earn. They look for opportunities to invest, and of course, rarely do they enter into a casino or buy lottery tickets. Surprisingly, uh, these stable qualities are the reason they got wealthy, as we said. Uh, they were not top of, uh, in their classes. They were only average SATs, and as a result, they developed determination and resilience. Now, here's the key characteristics of all these millionaires, we're still talking about them, is that they think differently from the crowd. And this, 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 they have a different mentality of, of not going towards consumerism and buying everything and believing that everything that we have, we identify with, and the more we have, the better off we will be. No, they think differently. And friends, true wealth is created when we partner with God. True wealth and true success comes from patient partnership with God and His principles over the long run. Where is your heart? Aidan Wilson Tosser, who was a well-known Christian pastor, he said the following, What we need today is a company of Christians who trust God as completely now as they know they must do at the last day. 
Our use of money and possessions is a decisive statement of our eternal values. What we do with our money loudly affirms which kingdom belongs to us. You know, someone says, show me your, your, uh, your checkbook, right, and I will tell you who you are. Um, and he keeps saying, the key to a right use of money and possessions is a right perspective, an eternal perspective. What I do today has tremendous bearing on eternity. The everyday choices I make regarding money are of eternal consequence. And another gentleman, Richard Halverson, said, Money is an exact index to a man's true character. All through scripture there is an intimate correlation between the development of a man's character and how he handles money. That's a very true statement. I believe, friends, that it is how we manage um, our money really tells us about our, our character. And, uh, you know, we were, my friend and I were talking during lunchtime, and um, he was telling me about his expenses for the wedding, because we were talking about wedding and everything, and, and he was telling me how much they spent on wedding, and he was telling me how much they spent on flowers, and it was significantly great. And here I was, <clears throat> boasting, no, I was just a little proud that I was telling him, you know, uh, we didn't spend very much on it, we're not, we, we're still making expenses, but we're not spending very much, you know, we're keeping it to what the basic needs are. And I said to him, you know, I believe that uh, the way a couple manages the finances for their wedding sets the tone for the way they will manage their finances in their marriage. And really, it is true, friends, that the way we do manage our money um, gives, as it said, it has that uh, uh, that measure of how and what our character is. John the Baptist, he preached a sermon on repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And at one point, Roman soldiers came to him asking, what shall we do? And replying to their question, John the Baptist said, be content with your wages. And friends, I believe that we need to learn to be content while we wait for Jesus to come. We need to have that spirit of contentment with what we already have. We need to uh, put away that spirit of covetousness, to put away that desire for what we can grow here, what we can have here, and have this spirit of contentment. In fact, the Bible says, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 and 8, it says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's, it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Notice how the Bible says, uh, the Apostle says that it is the basic needs of food and clothing that will bring us true contentment. Moreover, Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 13, it says, I, I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Now that famous Philippians 4.13, you all know it is in context of being content. Paul says that I can do everything as long as I am content. And friends, I believe what you believe. And I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And let us keep our eyes focused on him and on his soon return. Let us consider the eternal reward far better than our temporal things of this world. Let us be found faithful when Jesus comes that he may say to us, Well done good and faithful servant. I will make you ruler. Uh, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And friends, I ask you as an appeal, what would you rather have? The gold or the, gold or the riches of this world? Or would you rather have the eternal reward of spending time with Jesus? And that is our thought, friends. Where our treasure is, Jesus said, there your heart is also. I pray that as I live my life, 
And as I make even new transitions in life, that I can continually keep my eyes focused on the eternal reward. It takes, it takes patience. It takes, um, it takes prayer. But God has a, a wonderful reward for us, friends. May the Lord find us faithful when he returns. God